Thursday roundtable. Very excited about today's show and our topic, as well as our esteemed panelists. We've got a great set of panelists here today. Uh, they know a whole lot more about this subject than I do. I'm very excited to, uh, to have all of them. I'm going to announce them one by one. As you can see them on my screen, I'm going to go from the top left-hand corner and go to the bottom. And first, I have Dr. Donna Cato. She is the CEO of the Arizona Nurse Association. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show, Dr. Cato. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. And then we have uh, we have on my on the top right hand side we have Miss Julie Bowman. She is the CNO of Abrazo Arrowhead Hospital located in Arizona. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And then also we have Dr. Rhonda Anderson. She is the international consultant and president of the American Nurses Credentialing Center. Welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting us. Excellent. And we also have Dr. Judy Karshmer. She is the Dean uh, of, America, uh, of, of Arizona State University, Edson College of Nursing and Health Innovation. Welcome to the show. Delighted to be here. Looking forward to our conversation. I am as well. And those of you who are just now joining us, let us know what city, what state, what country you're coming in from. Uh, we would love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your questions, your comments as we go throughout this discussion. Uh, lots of things to unpack. Our main topic of discussion today is healthcare or health, yeah, healthcare without nurses, a critical concern. So I would like you to get us started off, Dr. Cato. By the way, uh, Dr. Cato, thanks for helping to put this panel together. Thank you so much for that, first of all. And then how did you come up with this? I love this, this, this title because it really helps to bring to light a very important subject. Sure. Well, as the chief executive officer of the Arizona Nurses Association, we know that there is um, a critical shortage of nurses, um, not only in Arizona, but nationally. And so this keeps me up at night because what would our world look like if we did not have nurses? So you think about the, the critical school nurse that takes care of our, our vulnerable children, whether they have chronic um, uh, health care concerns or health care issues, um, special needs children, um, our home health care nurses, what would it look like for those individuals that need to have home health care, whether it be wound care or um, special care within the home, dialysis nurses, correctional nurses. So it, this is a concern for me as we um, face the dilemma of having a, a nursing shortage and having a practice ready or prepared nursing workforce that's sustainable. I would like to add to that. Um, if you think Please. about hospital nursing, uh, the only reason a patient goes to the hospital is because they need very specific nursing care. Everything else can be done on an outpatient basis, and more and more has been done on an outpatient basis. So if you're critically ill and need care and no nurses, what happens? That's excellent. I would like to add to that. About 50% of the nurses that are licensed across the country work in the hospital setting. And so when you look at the shortages that are predicted ahead, both from the retiring workforce as well as those leaving the workforce from whatever conditions, uh, particularly the pandemic that we're in now, it's a very concerning picture. Absolutely. Dr. Karshmer? Yeah, I believe we all have a, um, a, a stake in this because we can't I think that if anything we've learned in the last 20 months during the COVID, is the fact that nurses have been there front and center caring for the patients. I just read a, a disturbing report from the WHO that over 100,000 healthcare workers have died due to COVID over the last, since oh. the inception of this. And so many nurses who have been taking care of the most, the most sick, the most ill folks who have been in the hospital, as Rhonda pointed out, they were in the hospital because they needed nursing care. Um, had to take care of their own families, their own health, their own their own well-being, and they're tired. And without a steady pipeline of new nurses into the workforce, we're all going to be in trouble because we're going to continue to have these kind of, of um, very challenging times. So as a nurse educator, this is near and dear to my heart. Well, I appreciate that. We also have quite a few that have already come in to say hello. We have uh, Raven Lewis from Tyler, Texas. Welcome, Raven. We have Colleen 
uh, Cubist. I don't hope I'm I hope I'm saying that correct. Uh, she's from Johannesburg, South Africa. Wow. Nice. Uh, so welcome, welcome to the to those of you who are just coming in. Let us know where you you're from if you haven't done it already. What city? What state? What country? As well as any questions that you have for us, we appreciate it. Doctor Malaska just also commented. She, she was, I was talking about this with to my patient just last night, Judith. So thank you very much uh, for mentioning that. Now, getting into this, um, do you think that a majority of healthcare leaders throughout the United States are aware of, of this issue? Let, let's talk about the awareness level. And if so, what level of awareness do you think we're at at this point? Um, Dr. Cato, would you like to comment on that first? Sure, I, I think absolutely our healthcare leaders are aware, and I think that um, they're being very innovative and strategic and thinking outside the box on ways to mitigate. Um, you know, there the workforce nurses leaving the workforce, how to keep how to retain nurses. Um, it's just a um, a national problem, and I'm very excited to see somebody from South Africa. It's a Problem as well, and I'm sure um, you know, Dr. Anderson can attest to that well as well with her international work. Um, but yeah, I think that in the United States we have some really um, thought leaders that are addressing them. Um, unfortunately, we're a little bit reactive, but um, I'm not sure that we're going to be in that position in the future because we have some great innovative ideas happening out there. This is Rhonda again. Um, the American Organization for Nurse Leaders just finished their second survey and they did a survey earlier in the year and just finished their second one it's clearly the top of their list mm -hmm. uh, as the issue that they are faced with and that they're trying to work on and then there is a group called the tri council but there are actually five organ major national organizations in it um, and they just finished one of their tri-council meetings where they identified workforce as a top issue and have uh, they've had a work group working toward some solutions, but they've stepped it up a couple notches to make sure that um, they're, they're really addressing it with some innovative things that uh, Dr. Cato was talking about. Appreciate that. Now, do you think there are any blind spots? And if so, what are those blind spots that perhaps some leaders may have that you're able to see from your end, perhaps we can shed some light on. Um, would you like to speak to that? Let's say, uh, for instance, Julie, in your position as CNO, there may be some areas you actually have to mention to your leadership. Um, have you noticed anything or think, anything you'd like to mention that perhaps may help other facilities? I would say there's an acute awareness from the C-suite, from the CEO through and including all C-suite leaders. So I think every organization is being affected at some level by the things that we're talking about. And I personally don't see a blind spot in the level of awareness where I think there may be a blind spot is preparing for what's ahead. And what I mean by that is if 50% of the workforce is over 50 and they're retiring and we have a large number of turnover, Probably most organizations are averaging five to 10% more, even with the COVID vaccination requirements, if an organization has that. And what's going to happen is we're going to meet a point where departure from the profession is met with an increased patient load, sicker patients, and we're going to have, it's a looming crisis. And so I think the blind spot is how do we get in front of this and plan for a workforce ready nurse that can step in that won't necessarily take a number of years to prepare but really get boots on the ground to um, help with what's ahead i think we have a probably a four or five year window would be my prediction of really needed to bolus i mean if you look at the state of arizona there's a hundred thousand nurses licensed in arizona if if 10 percent of those leave that's 10,000 nurses, let's put, you know, 50% leaving. And so magnify that to 4 million nurses across the country. So I personally think the blind spot is, how do we get in front of this with um, innovation 
and thought leaders that really bring to the table a solution that mitigates this before it falls. Makes sense. I, so, I would agree ahead. with Dr. with Julie, because as a nurse educator, it is our focus of how are we going to make a work, how are we going to prepare that next generation of nurses? I do believe a bit of a blind spot is the deployment of nurses to where they're needed. Um, we found during COVID that there were nurses that were needed in certain settings, ICUs, ventilator uh, assisted ability, and not so much in places that were turning patients away because of closure. So as a profession, I think that we need to work better at being able to nimble, be nimble in redeploying nurses to where they're needed. And the same token as a nurse educator, how do we better partner with the healthcare facilities, whether they're the schools or what that you were talking about, Donna, or the hospitals, um, how do we make sure that we're preparing nurses to move into those positions in a straightforward fashion? And I think that the only way we're going to get out of this in the long term is by better academic practice partnerships to prepare the, the nurse uh, for the future. Agreed. Love that. The other thing I would add to it is um, the use of technology and changing our models of care so that technology is a part of it. And um, the as I understand some of the things that happened during pa the pandemic or early in the pandemic, mm -hmm. those hospitals that had employed a um, virtual nursing approach to partnering with the nurses in the bedsides and the acute care really had a, a whole different approach to the care of that patient and, their, and and to the support of the nurse at the bedside and to the support, Judy, of the new to practice nurse. Uh, and it really made a difference in their outcomes. The, there's a lot of information about that out there now. So I do think that um, we have to be a little bit more open to the innovation and the opportunity and not just think that virtual care is around physician care. It's around all types of cares speech therapists, nursing, everybody. And it can be uh, deployed in a really positive way. And the patients love it actually, because they have more, almost more ready access because they can call up their virtual nurse anytime they want to. Mm -hmm. Nice, I like that. Okay, I've got a lot of comments that just come in. I wanna make sure that uh, I recognize several of these here. So we have Michelle uh, Rodriguez Belong, she says, Look like it might not be happening. I'm trying to think what point she was making of that, what, what point was being made when she said that, but that was something we just said. And then Joanne Bozanquet, uh, she says, in the UK, our old pension scheme enables a proportion of RNs to retire at age 55. This is increasing mm -hmm. post-COVID. We already have a large proportion of RNs over the age of 50, so it's a perfect storm. Wow, they've got a, they've got a tough situation there. And uh, yes. Dr. Malaska uh, says, and I'll let you guys comment on this. She says, we all we have all the same problems of staffing, recruitment, and retention, diversity, and inclusion from before the pandemic made worse now, and many hospitals are not still experiencing the blind spot. I see it on my travel nursing journey the past 26 months. So I got more comments, but before I go to the more comments, I want to let any of you who want to comment on what I just read, either one of those two comments. Sounds Dr. like Carson, our audience you know, is dialed in. It's probably acute and near and dear to everyone's heart. We're dealing with the same issues. It doesn't matter what hospital you represent. I think at, to some degree, every hospital and healthcare organization is experiencing the same challenges with recruitment and retention of a workforce that can care for the conditions that we find ourselves in. I recently read that the reason people are having a hard time hiring back people, this is not around nursing, but generally is because those workers are not feeling heard by their employers. And I think we can take a lesson in nursing about that, that the way to keep nurses and um, in fact, uh, implement innovation is to listen better to those nurses. So their good ideas get 
um, taken into consideration and used on a regular basis. That's the way we're going to keep a diverse workforce. That's the way we're going to keep an aging workforce because we're going to be more flexible. We'll be able to use some of the, the technology so nurses can deliver care in a different way, perhaps from their home. So I think that there are some, if we listen better, we can do a better job of keeping the workforce alive and well. Appreciate that. Now, Donna, Colleen. Donna and I, go, go ahead, Donna go might want to comment um, because we had a wonderful convention, AZNA did, and Rebecca Love talked about what Judy was saying. Maybe you want to say a little bit more about that, Donna. Sure. Sure. Uh, Rebecca Love um, actually wrote the book, uh, The Rebel Nurse, and she talks about hackathons. And hackathons are just a, a way to get nurses together um, to really brainstorm and think about a new way of doing things with pie in the sky, what would it look like if type of ideas. But very quick uh, ways to be innovative and to think about, you know, address a problem, be innovative and find a solution. Um, and it's been very sex successful. There are many um, hackathons that have come out of Rebecca's work that are now in, in practice and, and entrepreneurial in nature. So just an idea out there for those who want to uh, think about innovation within their, within their workforce, check out Rebecca Love and her hackathons. I love that idea. That is so cool. We've done a hackathon in our company. Those are, those are incredibly useful. We need to do one again. Mm -hmm. um, so now <laughs> Alex, he, he's making an observation that when I, just to folks I've been interviewing, the numbers seem relatively small, but he says that here in the U S nurses are leaving the bedside because employers are mandating the COVID vaccine. Uh, are you seeing that as being a huge thing or was there just already an inherent problem? That's just, uh, that's kind of like a, uh, kind of a tip on the proverbial iceberg. What, what do you think? Well, I would um, probably I can, reference Beckers who regularly reports the number of people leaving the workforce um, organization after organization where there were mandates. Um, some organizations have put in more along the lines of a requirement where we will look for you to be vaccinated and if not be tested. So there's a softer landing um, but I think we have a workforce that, despite the FDA approval, doesn't, to some degree, about 10% is what is being quoted, don't want to be told they have to be vaccinated. And for that reason, they're leaving the workforce. Interesting. Yeah. Um, any other comments on that before I move on? Yeah, I was just going to weigh in on that. Sure, I was going to yes. weigh in on that for just um, a little bit, too. There is literature out there that um, it's not a huge percentage of the workforce that is actually um, choosing to uh, be separated from their organization due to mandated um, vaccines. It's about 2% nationally, I think. Yeah, I, I've been hearing some pretty low numbers here too. Uh, just the the feedback I'm getting. There are there are people, yes, that are leaving, but this I, it's very small numbers overall. Um, Colleen from South Africa, she says, do your numbers, I'm sorry, do your nurses have to retire or can they choose to stay or be invited to stay? So when they, when, so how do we address it with the nurses getting a little bit older? Are they kind of being politely pushed out the door or are we trying yeah. to coerce them to stay in? What, what, is, what are some of the cases? I see you shaking your head, Rhonda. What, you, go ahead. What would you like to say about that? I've not seen any re, uh individuals who are of retirement age be pushed out and are across the I do a lot of work across the country and I, I don't see that. Um, what I do see is that maybe some of the innovations, I'll go back to the, mm -hmm. the virtual nurse, um, aren't being uh, given that as an option. And sometimes as you're older, and I'm talking about over 60, not, you know, 40, 50 year olds, um, but over 60, it's a little rough at the bedside and especially with the pandemic, it was very rough at the bedside for them in critical care. But there are those other options where they're, because it's not just the physical care, it's the clinical knowledge and the use of all the data around that patient that a nurse brings to that care. And so they can do that through, through the virtual nursing. There are other ways, and I think um, there are some organizations who have, have implemented that way before pan the pandemic, but um, 
there's much more in that space that we could do to retain retire potential retirees. We definitely want to retain those that are nearing retirement age and whether that's some kind of accommodation, um, you know, in a schedule or whatever can be done. We don't want those years of experience to leave the bedside for any reason, unless it's their own personal choice. Oh, and there's so many that. opportunities for um, precepting mm -hmm. a, a new to practice or a new to practice environment nurse mm -hmm. and not have to take a patient care assignment, but work with that and be the mentor. There was something in one of your comments about mentorship and they are wonderful mentors that that would Agreed. be a huge loss. Okay. Agreed. I like this idea about the more preceptors and mentors. Um, do you think that there could be more flexibility possibly with their, their schedules? We don't have to do those long 12, 13, 14 hour shifts and it just works, you know, I don't know, banker's hours or something. Is that even possible for these preceptors? Yes. You know, there, there, even years ago, we did that. Um, and, and there were hours during the day, like admissions and discharges that were heavier um, in the overall workload. And so we had some admission, when I was working in a hospital in Illinois, we had some mission nurses, we had some discharge nurses, and they only had, you know, the four hour shifts, it was based on the, the data that we had. But there's a lot of opportunity for that type of innovation. Truly agreed. And Dr. Carson, you're going to say like, something. Yeah, the initiatives that are hospital at home, where patients are staying home, uh, not being admitted to the hospital. Um, and as um, Rhonda mentioned, the whole idea that this is a way to use the expertise of a nurse um, through remote the remote delivery. I think there are lots of ways that we can, yeah. if we let ourselves listen to our patients in this case, what kind of care they want, we can then better utilize the expertise of the nurse. Ah, oh, yes, very good. Well, okay. I, may I give an example? Sure, And please. this was way before the pandemic. On the adult side, when the hospitals were starting pay for performance, and it was a uh, it started with the the um, cardiac population. One of the hospitals with which I worked um, on the we uh, gave every patient an iPad, a cardiac patient, an iPad, and we had a nurse and a pharmacist and a health coach that were virtual with that patient. And when they were discharged, they had to check in every morning and bring you know, vital signs, meds, et cetera, at, from home. Um, but the thing they loved most, were actually there were two things. Their, their team really was focused on them at that time and really helped them a lot. But the other thing that they loved is they didn't have to go sit in the doctor's office someplace uh, for some small question that they had or wait on the telephone for a small question. Any time during the day after they had their expected check-in, they could call back and have a virtual conversation with that team about whatever their question was. It was fabulous. Decreased all the emergency department um, visits. It was just amazing the data that came out of that. Readmissions to the hospital just plummeted. It was fabulous. So there's ways to do this and the nurses loved the work. And Judy, we had students come and observe so that they were able to really see that there's different ways to practice. It was fabulous. Oh, I love that. It's a great That's example. Great. Um, okay, and then here's some more comments that came in. So Dr. Malaska Rosina, she says, uh, meant to say, when she commented earlier, she says she meant to say hospitals, most hospitals are uh, they have a blind spot and not doing much to address the problem. So that was, she wanted to just clarify what she had said earlier. Alex also chimed in again. He says they have to reinvent themselves again, uh, going to work to work, work in primary care offices that are currently not mandating. Oh, I see. So he's talking about the nurses who I guess find themselves out of the hospital. They're going to have to guess reinvent themselves in, in the primary care environment. I see. Uh, and of course, telehealth, right? I guess telehealth is probably another area for them. Um, Joanne says, we also need to expand placement opportunities, move our student nurses out to the wider system. 
experience of housing departments, social services, charities, not-for-profit organizations. The list goes on. Any thoughts on that? Uh, in fact, Judy, would you like to address that? That's kind of your area. I'd love to because we are um, actively doing that kind of work. We have um, nursing students in very non-traditional ways from very high and senior uh, centers for 55 and plus where they do the bulk of their clinical experiences with healthy seniors as well as uh, memory care or home health. We have students who are doing all of their clinical experiences in behavioral health. In the, we have students that are doing uh, the bulk of their clinical experience in their hometown hospital, taking their classes through a virtual um, uh, remote like this, but staying at home so they can do their clinical experiences in a critical access hospital, in a small hospital. And we're also looking at um, service lines where students do uh, their experiences all in primary care and home health. We have a whole cohort of students that are doing um, pretty much uh, telehealth in the home with some in-person primary care visits. So what we're trying to do is take the students where the future is. And um, I'm happy to say that my nurse colleagues in the community and in the facilities are saying, bring them on. That's I love that. I'm, I'm so Excellent. happy to hear that. Um, so Julie, do you see opportunities in your system, uh, where that could be perhaps utilized? Uh, just, for, I'd like to hear your, from operations, being in operations like you are, um, what, what do you see from your perspective? Well, I concur with what Judy's saying. The more we can socialize the nurses into the settings that she described, because those are the settings where patients need to go to, we could have in our system, but I don't believe I just represent our system with this comment, we can have patients waiting for placement in some of those facilities outside of the hospital setting. And so if we have people prepared there um, and have organizations ready to take them, that helps a lot with hospital um, throughput and getting patients out of the emergency department that's already overcrowded. But I think more importantly is just this notion around social determinants of health and health equity, and really making sure that we meet the needs of patients irregardless of any factors. Um, everyone should be treated the same as a patient. Important points, and I think important settings and innovative for the ASU team to put students in those settings. Excellent, and Donna, I don't know if you wanna think, I know you've got several other constituents in your organization throughout Arizona. Um, have you heard any other feedback that you'd like to share here in terms of them perhaps using the lesser trained nurses and in, in other other areas of healthcare? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment on, you know, on Julie, it's that throughput, right? How do we support the whole industry of healthcare? Um, with uh, individuals that are able to practice to the full extent of their licensure education. Um, and it's so important to think about, you know, those those other services um, outside the acute care walls. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. Okay. More comments coming in. Uh, thank you, everyone, for all these comments. This is great. Um, Brian Hudson. Great. Welcome, Brian. Uh, he says, hospitals have traditionally seen nursing as an expense and have not been innovative in developing true compensation strategies that reflect the value of nursing in our healthcare system. Um, okay, so I see Julie's kind of shaking her head to that. What do you, what do you <laughs> Don't get do you me think started. That, Julie? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he raises a great point. And I think the organizations that will survive in the future recognize that nursing is not just an expense or a line item. We bring value to the organization patients come for nursing care, they come for medical care and surgical care. But um, the, the hospitals and the C teams that recognize the value of nursing will be the hospitals that are successful in the future. Very much so. Absolutely. There was a, um, there was a movement here at, in way back when uh, at St. Luke's Hospital and then it spread through a variety of states. Ann Van Slyke, who is no longer with us, um, had costing out nursing care so that it wasn't part of the room rate, but it really identified the value of the nurse and what the nurse brought. 
Um, that, as it's been discussed at AONL and other organizations, is being raised again. And uh, it, it went for probably, I would say, Donna, maybe five years, something like that. And it spread through about uh, 80 hospitals throughout the U.S. And then for some reason, it just stopped. Um, and one never knows why those things happen, but it did. But it is being raised again, and all of her research is being used to, as a foundation to start that conversation and to uh, develop the model for us and for the future uh, so that we'll be able to actually show that value versus having it just for, in the room rate. Well, it's reframing that instead of it being the cost of nursing, it's the value of nursing. Yes. And the people on the call know the value of nursing and all the hospital acquired conditions that can be prevented with excellent nursing care. And all those acquired conditions add to length of stay, add to cost of care, add to um, d discharge dispositions requiring home health and skilled nursing, et cetera, et cetera. So really um, the value of nursing cannot be stated enough. There's a lot of great research out there about this. Yeah, those are, those well, are great points. And I think it's also important to highlight that 19 years nursing has been uh, identified in the public poll as the most trusted profession for the last 19 years. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I think I think that there are nurses that deserve this right here. <laughs> That's a great point. But, you know, <laughs> earlier, going back to earlier, uh, I think Alex mentioned this about folks leaving, some folks, even though the numbers may not be huge, we need all the help we can get, right? If they leave, could we still employ them for these telehealth roles where they wouldn't necessarily be in front of the patients? Because because it's not only the protection for them, it's also protection for the patients. Is that being looked at? I'm just curious. It just it popped in my head as we were talking about it. Yes, I think we're looking at all those options, um, uh, different uh, delivery models that could keep uh, folks uh, employed, keep them working uh, beyond wanting to work those eight to 12 hour shifts. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, we have learned that as I think, Julie, you mentioned uh, patients, they like, they like the telehealth visit. They like not having to drive. They like not having to wait uh, in a waiting room. And I know that there are a lot of um, current resources that we can already put into the home to monitor patients, uh, mm -hmm. that they can keep track of, of certain things that they need to. So I think there are some pretty exciting things in the future. We just have to keep our eyes and our ears and our will open to them. Love it. Okay. There's so many comments coming in. Let me just make sure I, I catch some of this. So Colleen says, yes, they can stay, but they're voting with their feet. We need to create more appropriate roles for this cohort. I wonder if she's talking about the same folks I'm talking about. So much knowledge, ex explore and skill. We could develop an amazing mentorship offer to our early career RNs. Oh, she's talking about the, the older uh, RNs. That's great. I love it. Yeah. And I, I'm over 50. I just I just made 50 not long ago. So now I'm in that crowd of over 50. So I'm, I'm, I'm that much more... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that much more sense of that. Rosina says, you got it right, Dr. Judith. She says, I have seen many nurses quit the ICU at one assignment. Approximately 98% of the unit is now staffed with travel agency nurses, state and FEMA nurses. Um, and Joanne says, wow, I joined the nurse hack for heal, heal help for health last year. Loved it. So to your point, Donna, Joanne says she's she's been doing that. Alex says Colleen at uh, Penn Net Medicine, a regional healthcare system in the Philly area. Uh, we are seeing nurses of childbearing age who are not comfortable getting the vaccine. Leaving vaccines are mandated for employees in this healthcare system, so they are not to be invited to stay. I, I think Alex he, he's 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 pretty locked in on this vaccine uh, conversation. In, <laughs> any comments on that before I move on to my next? Thank you, thank you, Alex. Before I move on to my next comment. Okay, everybody's quiet on that one. Okay, so Brian Hudson, he says, technology <laughs> and alternative care sites have created many opportunities away from the bedside. True. Um, and 
Rosina says, totally agree, Rhonda. Um, Rollis? Sure. I, I was just going to weigh in a little bit on some of the comments that I was reading around um, psychological well-being and work-life balance. I just wanted to raise up that, you know, there's a lot of innovative space going on in that area of how we support our nurses. Um, they've been through a lot this past year and how do we um, decrease the stigma uh, when they need help and support. Um, so we've done a lot of that work here in Arizona. We actually started a text messaging platform to give tools and tips and strategies and accolades to our nurses. Um, you can text RN Connect to 60298 and get uh, some of those um, tools and tips. Any nurse can join in. And it's been very successful here in Arizona. Not meant to replace, but to augment um, services and and feel have the nurses feel good about the work that they do. I That's love that. We're going to add that to the post, by the way. Joanne, can you make sure and add what she just said? Can you give us that number one more time? RN Connect. RN Connect to 60298. Okay. It's a we'll text the I look forward ahead, to Julie. receiving. It's a text I look forward to receiving. It's very encouraging and motivational, and I think very real with the times, very real. So thank you for Excellent. doing that. Other things that organizations are doing, I know um, our organization is trying to provide different avenues of support aside from EAP or employee assistance, is also providing some spiritual support with a chaplain that rounds with some special messages and blessings of the hands um, and also um, psychological support. So really just trying to find the different aspects that would speak to the individual and to what their needs are. The burden, the psychological and physical burden, particularly for those caring for the COVID patients cannot be stressed enough because of visitation restrictions, not only is their burden towards rendering nursing care, but they become the patient's family. It's the only face that they see besides one face or a virtual face, depending on the visitation restrictions. Appreciate that. I forgot to tell you guys about our water break. We usually have it about halfway through and I missed my cue a little earlier. So if you've got some water and you want to take a swig of your water, please, you have permission to do that. <laughs> Okay. Um, Rollis, so I can I a, just uh, confirm? Sure. I see the RN Connect is um, the RN Connect to 60298. Okay. 60298. Let's get that corrected. So, so Jan, do that for us. That she put it in there already. She's fast. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Joanne, yeah. uh, uh Bozan quit. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Who, you know, I just point? wanted to build upon what Julie said about um, taking care of ourselves. Um, uh -huh. It's not just knowing that that's important to take care of ourselves, but our institutions, the structure needs to um, encourage that and then reward that. So it can't be just go take care of yourself. We've got to look at some structural problems that, uh, and it's, it, this is obviously for nurses, but it's true for all employees that they... Um, have health practices or wellness practices that are not only encouraged but rewarded. I think that's important yeah. and it'll help, you know, and, and it's so different. There's not a one size fits all. You know, some people, uh, the health practice might be something physical, some people might be going to school. It needs to be tailored to the person. Individual. Okay, so Judy, we've got just, lots more questions we've got to address. I'm sorry, who, 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 who someone's going to say something? This is Rhonda. I just want to add to that um, what we had uh, talked about before about listening to our nurses, because what we've also heard to, for the pandemic is sometimes people think bringing pizza in is uh, helpful, and the staff are saying that's not what we want. So really finding out what those practices are and what they feel will help them is such a key. To, to really making the environment and the culture the way we need to have it. So true. I just read an article like that, like yesterday or the day before about pizza versus, <laughs> yes. Yes, that was that was good. Okay, um, I have several questions from the audience and I wanna ask uh, the, the, the questions. But before that, I have, a very, I have a very important question for you guys, okay? Who wants to answer it first? It's my would you rather question. 
Who's Susie? Sure, brave? I will. <laughs> okay, Julie's brave. Julie, okay, Ju Julie, I appreciate that. Okay, you're gonna get it first. Okay, so um, would you rather have the song of your choice play whenever you walk, or have your own mood lighting wherever you are? I love music. Are oh, you gonna so go for the music? The, huh? Be the music. Yeah. Why? Why, why is that? Well, I think, you know, just tying back to what Judy was saying, every individual has something that speaks to their heart and music speaks to my heart, but it may be mood lighting that speaks to someone else's heart. You know, your heart and soul, there's something that brings that warm feeling to you. And for me, it's music. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. So I got a chance to know a little bit more about you there. Okay. So <laughs> does anyone else want to ask that question before I go to the audience again? Who, who else wants to be a brave one? I will. Okay, go ahead, Rhonda, please. Which, which one would you I'm, choose? Well, I'm where Julie is from, from a music perspective. And I will use a term we used when I was CEO of a children's hospital. The children told us music is therapy for them. And we had a place where they could go. They could play any music they wanted. Yeah. We also had CDs that they could play in their rooms. And it was also brain development for them, mm -hmm. uh, especially for mm -hmm. our neonates where we would put music in their little isolate. So just uh, for me, music is therapy. Love that. Okay, that was uh, that warms my heart. Love those two questions, those three answers. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the, to the comments here. So we have a question from Joanne. She says, the big question is, what does a population need from us? Um, Donna, would you like to address that for us? What does a population need from us? What, what's your opinion on that? Um, can you clarify population? Are you talking about the nursing population or generic I'm going to let population? you pick because I don't know. They didn't say. So I'm going to let you pick. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the profession needs support from the population. Uh, we need our, our communities to understand what we've just been through as a profession and to help us um, by adhering to the CDC guidelines um, and so that we can decrease those admissions into the hospitals, um, so that we can um, decrease the burnout and the stress and the, um, the overtaxing of our healthcare systems. Got it. I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh... Of that and so does anyone want to comment on this the, the, the folks in the population because now joanne's following up and asking about citizens so how about the overall population what do you think the population needs from us right now who'd like to speak to that well you know i i think that the population needs to know that nurses are in it for the long haul we we're not a fly-by-night organization we haven't just shown up when uh covid was here and we're not going away we're here we're there and we are going to continue to um care for folks where they need us. And that's probably the best promise of a profession to a citizenship that I can think of. Love Amen. that. That's great. Okay. Colleen, there's another question. She says uh, 55 to 65 is really young. I'm thinking, I'm starting to think that way too. Uh, <laughs> what, what would it take to convince them to stay? So uh, what, what do you think? Julie, would you like to speak to that? What do you think it'll take? What do you think it'll take to get them to stay? I think we have to ask the 55 to 65 year olds. I can speculate what they would say, but I think we would have to ask them, but I'm quite certain that we would hear modified schedules or work hours, you know, not a 12 hour shift, but maybe a four or six hour shift. Um, they're gonna wanna feel valued and part of a team. And I don't really even think that it's largely the pay um, as much as it is feeling engaged and part of a team that's making a difference. Um, but as I said, we would have to ask that um, age of workforce of which I am a part of now, <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> what means something to them. <laughs> I was going to say a lot of them are staying. In fact, if you look at the average age of the nurse, 50%. It's pretty high. And I think that's one of the concerns that large systems have. They look at the el the retiree eligible population, mm -hmm. and so many are eligible. Now, the good news is they're not going yet, but um, it could happen. That's why the, the pipeline of new nurses is so crucial. That okay, pipeline so cannot be stated enough that 
50% of the workforce over 50 means we have about a five to whatever year window to prepare for that departure. So that, that really goes to show that you guys have been doing a great job retaining nurses beyond 50 if the average age is that high. Oh, yeah. So, okay. So here, here's a question I have that I, I, I hear it time and time again from hiring managers as we work with, with, with our clients is I, I can't handle any more new grants because I don't have the staff to preceptor them and really help them along. Uh, we, we're, we're just, we're just rocking and rolling here. We got to have some people that can just work. So that's why they're sometimes going towards the travel, uh, agent nurses to travel, travel nurses versus getting in more new grads. So, um, how are we starting to address that problem? And since Judy, you're, you're my education person right now, maybe you could talk to that first. Cause like, yeah. first I, I just interviewed one lady the other day. She's, I, I was, I was a new grad. I'm in the OR. I wasn't taught this in, 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 in school. So I'm learning yeah. how to do the OR here. So. Please. This is something that I spend a lot of time thinking. And Donna mentioned what keeps her up at night. This keeps me up at night. Um, and I think that the only way forward is through partnerships, because it's not preparing the, the generic new nurse and then sending him or her to the OR or the whatever. It's partnering with a system, with a hospital, with a, with a, a facility and saying, where is your need now? How can we start with, yes, it's going to take some effort, that, that undergraduate student, new, new, employ, new nurse training, yes, over time. But by the time that person graduates from your facility, we're going to have somebody who has been there, partnered with you, and is work ready. And uh, Julie and I have had experience doing this kind of work that really says we're going to, instead of just sending you new grads, we're going to send our new students to you for the bulk of their, their experiences. So when they do graduate, they are ready. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to weigh in on that too, Rollis. Okay. Um, th it's a paradigm shift, right? We've spent five, historically, we've spent five years getting nurses ready for the practice area. They went to med surge and they had a lot of, you know, a lot of time to transition. And we need to significantly decrease that a time from graduation to practice ready. And I think it's through those partnerships and those innovative um, strategies, you know, being flexible, adaptable, meeting the needs of the work demands is critical. Very good. This is great. And I, I just want to really thank the audience because they have so many comments. I have literally no chance of getting through all these in the next four <laughs> minutes. So thank you very much, everyone who has commented. And we're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to read all of them eventually. So uh, before we sign off here, I wanted to give each of you about a minute to just share whatever your best advice is for our folks who are watching or, or who may be watching the replay. If you're watching the replay, please comment. Let us know what you think and please uh, participate. So I'm going to start with uh, Donna and then Julie and then Rhonda and then Judy. How about that? Sure. My best advice is uh, we've talked a lot about empowering nurses and each of us has a role to play. Uh, make sure that the, our profession and the identity of our profession is portrayed in to the public in a positive manner and be active in the profession through advocacy, mentoring, precepting, you know, giving back. I think it's going to take all of us. Um, to, to get us through this this time right now, um, but we can do it because we have a strong professional footprint and I think that we can do it not only here in the United States, but globally. Very good. Excellent. And Julie, please. I concur with Donna's point and then I would pair it with pipeline planning. And so each organization has to look at how or what meets their needs and so my organization and others i'm sure are all looking at this but the way that the organization will be successful is to tap into their front line and engage those leaders um, to help us be successful with our pipeline planning and i have a great example of it i won't belabor the point but at our organization we have a few staff nurses that are really um, leading a nurse extern program that is phenomenal and that is the level of engagement that is required. And there's other examples of that that Judy referenced. Um, so pipeline planning will be the key to success. Thank you for that. Rhonda, please. 
I agree with my colleagues, and I would add to that um, that we need to be, uh, all of us need to be positive. We're a trusted profession. And when I hear some of the media that is so negative right now, even about our profession, it really concerns me. So I think more of this type of, of discussion, but with the larger public and some positive things that get out to the public is, is key. And the other thing is to really start working, and Donna and I are working on this, um, with the younger, and I'm talking about grade school, high school, and really talk about the pipeline, not mm. just you know later. And so uh, with a whole variety of partners, and I'm just gonna use one, like the Girl Scouts, um, it's an opportunity for us, or like the schools, and set up those model, modules, models, excuse me, so that we really can talk and show how wonderful this profession is. Because it, it, if we don't do it, nobody else is gonna do it. And the public will be confused. And we need to not have the public confused, and we need early, early adoption I want to be in healthcare and I want to be a nurse. I love that. I love that. And you know what? I, I'll just bitch. I want to pick up one thing on this. I was looking at population numbers and only about, I think less than five, around 5% self-report as Hispanic for nurses, but the population of the United States is much higher than that. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge disparity there just within that one demographic. And we could probably find other things too. There's some disparities there where we have a lack of representation. And I think that could be an opportunity to get them early, you know, get them early. Like you said, Rhonda, right there in grade school. I love it. Thank you for that. Okay. Judy, what? give us your, your last bits of, bits of advice, please. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for bringing up this topic. Thank you for inviting me to participate. Anytime I get to talk about my passion, nursing and nursing education, it's like a treat. So thank you. I think that what I'd like to add to my colleagues is the fact that the need for nurses today is going to be different tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And where we're gonna be doing nursing care, the kind of nursing care that we're gonna be doing, we need to be very forward thinking as opposed to backward thinking. And I can't agree more about the need to diversify our profession. Um, uh, with we need to we need to have a profession that reflects the populations that we work with. And this is an area that we need increasing work. And the only way we're going to be successful in this is if we think on new models of nursing education to reach these populations. So thank you for raising that. It's really important. I what got us here won't keep us here, right? <laughs> with that. Truly. What got us here won't keep us here. That's, That's right. true. Exactly. That's true. You know, uh, another thing, and I wish we had more time to talk about this. Colleen had a great comment. She says, um, no visiting has added to the responsibility to care for patient and support to the family. Truly. Doctors and nurses have shared all uh, all they, uh, they could. Uh, so uh, that's another great point is that, you know, the, the, it was already a hard job, but now you got to do more because they, they, their visitors can't come in. So yep. that's, that's great. I've gotten several comments asking for a sequel. <laughs> so can I have you guys come back? Absolutely. Sure. Okay. Sure. So we're going to do a sequel guys. We're going to, those who are watching, we're all going to have a sequel. Um, <laughs> really appreciate you guys coming on. I'm just going to take one last check in with my audience and just see what they thought of today's session. Look at that. It's a rounding success. We really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. Donna, I want to thank you for, for getting this, this panel together. And each of you individually, Julie, Rhonda, and Judy, uh, you were amazing today. All of you, all four of you. So thank you for being on. Thank you for all the amazing comments. I mean, A plus for the comments today. This was amazing. I couldn't even go through all of them. Fantastic. Thank, thank you. you. All right, let's say bye to everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, <laughs> bye everyone. Bye. Okay, so Thank before you, you jump off, uh, before you jump off, I'm she's going to make sure we can get in in the meeting. Alrighty, Joanne, let me know. I'm going to trust. Okay, I think we're good. Thank you, everyone. Have a great.